I grew up in a loving family, and I was a happy young kid. But when I was 12 years old, I was diagnosed with depression and an eating disorder called anorexia. Now, a few things happened earlier that year that changed everything. A girl who I really liked broke up with me and did it in the middle of the school cafeteria. Exactly. <laughs> then I found out that she had been dating my best friend behind my back. Even worse. <laughs> so feeling embarrassed and confused, a little overwhelmed, I skipped some school and some soccer practices the next few weeks. Coach got so mad at me because we lost a few games that he kicked me off the team, adding that I had gotten fat and was out of shape. So, within a few weeks, I lost everything that was important to me as a 12-year-old boy. My girl, my best friend, and a sport that I loved. And I did feel out of control. I felt rejected, and I blamed it all on my weight. What I felt, I could control. It started off, I just wanted to lose a few pounds. And... That didn't work. I was 12. I didn't know how to diet. I actually gained weight. So I tried a different approach, and I just stopped eating and started compulsively exercising altogether. And my preoccupation with food and exercise, that's when that set in, as well as depression. And nights were the worst. I'd be laying in bed with insomnia, my mind racing, counting calories, the 500 push-ups and sit-ups I was going to do the next morning, and even at times, how I was going to commit suicide. This is a picture of my eighth grade school yearbook. I'm 76 pounds, five foot four, and I've just lost 30 pounds in less than two months. You can't tell, but I'm wearing four shirts under that sweater. You can probably tell the bones in my face and my thinning hair. This picture was taken just one hour before my mom pulled me out of school yet again to take me to the doctor. And this time the doctor huddled with other doctors because they had never treated a young boy like me. This was the 80s and they assumed anorexia only impacted girls and they told my mom I may not survive. I am alive today for two reasons, the unconditional love of my family and professional counseling. I'm in front of you today to share a small part of my story from a young boy's perspective, recovering from anorexia and depression and how I've grown up to live with it and think differently about it as a man. According to the National Eating Disorders Association, the World Health Organization, and the CDC, the increasing rates of childhood anxiety, depression, and suicide are alarming. We are in an urgent mental health crisis. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among children and young adults, depression being its leading contributor. Of the estimated 20 million people in the United States alone who are suffering from an eating disorder, many of whom are undiagnosed, one in three are now male. We are living in a silent mental health epidemic that will only get worse unless we do more about it. So as I received immediate treatment and gained back some of the weight to survive, I appeared to be normal on the outside. I felt anything but normal on the inside, and how I craved to feel normal again. I started hanging out with some people who accepted me, but they made bad group decisions. Drugs, stealing, sneaking out in the middle of the house at night. I'm not looking forward to my mom watching this. <laughs> One day we're at a store, and we're all stealing things. And I'm the only one that gets caught. Long story short, I am arrested for shoplifting. When school finds out 
they suspend me from school, and my arrest even earned front page headlines in the school paper. Snyder's son gets arrested. My mom was a teacher at the school. <laughs> now the shame I felt was for the embarrassment that I caused my family. So luckily, high school graduation was just around the corner. I was going to go off to college where everything would be a clean slate. No. I struggled my first year. Didn't fit in. My depression creeped back in. I actually tried dropping out of school several times. But the dean of students who had to sign my withdrawal form, he was a good listener. He always motivated me to keep trying and not quit. And he would say, Kevin, just give me two more weeks before you make a life-changing decision that you might regret. He said, I encourage you just to get involved in more campus organizations. Meet some people. So I joined a fraternity. And one, one day at our annual campfire retreat, one of the Brotherhood activities around the fire was to pick out a blue card that had a question on it and read out the question out loud and answer it. What are you most proud of? was my question. And in a moment of vulnerability, I shared, I'm most proud of not killing myself. And I shared my story for the first time about having anorexia, depression, and even the arrest to a bunch of guys I barely knew. And I expected them to kick me out of the group. What do you think happened? They walked up to me one by one that night and in the days ahead thanking me. Some giving me brotherly chest bumps of affection. <laughs> and many of them also sharing their story about mental health and thanking me for inspiring them to reveal their story as well. And this is when college became transformational for me. I had an amazing college experience after this. In fact, one of the best things about it was I realized I could stop chasing normal because normal doesn't exist. I stopped trying to be normal. One thing I learned in college is ain't nobody normal. <laughs> You're not normal. I'm not normal. So what I'd like to do, this is the interactive part of my speech. Get ready. Look to somebody sitting next to you or near you. Make eye contact with them right now. Stop looking at me. And say to them, You're not normal. <laughs> Now, same person, eye contact, say this. Because you're unique. None of us are normal because all of us are unique. Yes or yes? So I graduated with a degree in marine biology. Obviously. But what I really wanted to do was to work at a college campus. I wanted to be the dean who helped me who helped other kids struggling not feel so alone. And then something happened out of the blue that changed everything. And by the way, I need to provide a listener disclaimer. Listener discretion is advised for this next story. I was invited to a dinner at an older work colleague's house of mine who I respected. We grilled tuna steaks, asparagus, and I had one strawberry daiquiri. He slipped a drug in my drink. Knocked me out. A few hours later, I wake up on the couch. My pants are off, and he's on top. As I realize he was sexually assaulting me as I was passed out, I kick him off. I felt dirty, I felt weak, and I was angry at myself, as if I was the problem, that I should have not been there anyway and I could have prevented it. And like most victims, I did not press charges because I didn't want anyone to know. And I carried this shame with me for years, even as I continued in my journey to become that dean of students. And I worked at several different universities in several different positions. I taught courses, I even earned a doctorate degree the highest credential of my profession. And ironically, my research was based on qualitative interviews, listening to the stories of students. <laughs> and I achieved my dream. I became a young dean of students 
at a private university. And my conversations with students, whether they were in the classroom, or whether they were in my office or in my research interviews, I would hear their all too familiar stories about their own pain and suffering, about their lack of belonging and carrying their shame. And man, did I have empathy. I listened, I understood, and I was fascinated by the power of their vulnerability, but also I felt like a hypocrite for not sharing mine. I was still struggling. And then something happened that forever changed everything yet again. I was asked to present a keynote at a student leadership conference. It's actually the same best. <laughs> but to share my research findings. And in that moment, I had another moment of vulnerability where I shared my story for the first time with a thousand strangers I didn't even know. And I told them about my depression, my anorexia, and for the first time, I revealed the sexual assault. Now, I expected them to boo me off stage. I expected the meeting planner who hired me to ask for the money back. But what do you think happened? There was a line of students waiting to talk with me afterward, thanking me, many of them with tears, saying, you inspired me to no longer have to hide my shame any longer as well. And this is when the next morning, I wake up to an email from a young girl. She says, hi, my name's Kelly. I came to this conference to kill myself. She shared that she was also battling depression, anxiety, and was recovering from a sexual assault. She shared that the only reason she did not want to attend my speech was because that was when she was going to commit suicide, when no one else could stop her. But what happened was one of her classmates returned to the room unexpectedly for a forgotten item, seeing Kelly jokingly tell her my speech was mandatory, and then pulling her literally out of the hotel room, unknowingly saving her life. And after meeting Kelly and after speaking at that conference, I did a lot of soul searching. And I reflected on what is my purpose? How can I share my story for greater impact? And as crazy as it might sound, I quit my dream job as a dean of students to pursue this new crazy dream called professional speaking, which is why I'm in front of you today. And and to date, I've spoken for over a million people, over a thousand organizations in all 50 states and several countries. But one of the things I discovered that made this all come full circle was we cannot just forget and move on from something negative that's happened in our past. It's impossible to do that. But we can move forward with it. And we will, should want to use that for good to help others. This is how we create positive change. This is how we give our past new meaning. This is how we give purpose to what we've gone through. And when people write me or come up and talk to me after a speech, they normally don't thank me for my leadership framework or how to help them be a better student, boss, or employee. No, they thank me for how to help them become a better human. So as you think about any past experiences that you've been struggling with, or maybe currently are. Maybe you think about some pain you've caused someone, and you're holding it. Ask yourself this question. How can you use it for good to help others? We come with new meaning. I am a blessed husband and 
I am also a blessed father to two young, amazing children who I know I cannot protect from some of the adversity that they're going to experience. This is Isla, this is Ashton, and my beautiful wife, Becca, who's here today. I was recently going through my attic, and I came across the journal from when I was a teenager, and I wrote in it compulsively. And I thought about throwing it away, because I didn't want to read it. But I opened it. And it was painful. I wrote a poem recently for my kids to show them how I think differently now and how I want to use my past for good. And what I'd like to do is share it with you to show you how I've reversed it, how I've thought differently. And I wrote a song as well that will go with it. My thinking can never be changed. So stop trying to tell me that things can be different and hope always prevails. Because at the end of the day, it's too much of a negative and divisive world. So I'm not gonna lie to you or myself by saying there is hope for a better future. I believe that I'm incapable of making a real difference. And nothing you say will persuade me. I've made too many mistakes in the past. I just don't believe the nonsense that my past struggles have developed strength. Because when I look in the mirror, can my thinking really be any different? Can my thinking really be any different? Because when I look in the mirror, my past struggles have developed strength. I just don't believe the nonsense that I've made too many mistakes in the past. And nothing you say will persuade me that I'm incapable of making a real difference. I believe there is hope for a better future. So I'm not going to lie to you or myself by saying it's too much of a negative and divisive world. Because at the end of the day, things can be different. And hope always prevails. So stop trying to tell me that my thinking How I think differently to move forward with it. I believe we can think differently. Will you join me?